everybody. I'm Pilar Gerasimo, founding editor with Experience Life magazine, and I'm delighted today to be joined by Dr. Mark Hyman, who is one of our favorite sources at Experience Life, has been for almost the past 10 years. And you know him probably best as a nine-time New, New York Times bestseller, just about to become a 10-time, I think, with this new book, Eat Fat, <laughs> Get Thin. Welcome and thanks for joining us today, Dr. Hyman. Thanks for having me, Pilar. Yeah, can I call you Mark? Is that okay? Yeah, of course. <laughs> We've been Mark and I have been friends for many, many years, and uh, I've come to rely on him for insight on all topics, health, wellness, progressive medicine, and particularly in this realm of nutrition around fat, dietary fat, which is a conundrum for many people as they're, as they're choosing to switch their eating for general health and well-being and vitality and weight loss. There's a lot of controversy and increasingly a shifting of tides around dietary fat, which I know is why, among other reasons, you wrote this book, Mark. But tell us a little bit about the um, the journey that got you here. I know you and I have been talking for the better part of a decade about how people's viewpoints on dietary fat has not been entirely right on. And you just you took a big dive into the science on this one. It's true. You know, I I first sort of began to realize that the low-fat message didn't make sense when I just saw my patients not responding to the diet and their diabetes getting worse and their lipids getting worse, them not losing weight. And and then I began to see little snippets in the literature. First paper I ever read that sort of blew my mind was Walter Willa. And I, I just talked to him the other day about the research that he did back in, I think it was like in the early 2000s, maybe 2001 or two, and he wrote a paper called Dietary Fat is Not a Major Determinant of Body Fat. And at the time, you know, it was when we were told to eat fats and oil sparingly. The 1992 food pyramid had six to 11 servings of bread, rice, cereal, and pasta at the bottom. And we were all convinced that low fat was the answer to weight loss and the prevention of heart disease. And that sort of began to crumble. And in my first book, Ultra Prevention, which I wrote, gosh, I'm like 15 years ago, uh, I I basically had a chapter there called "Fat is Not a Four Letter Word," <laughs> and and it was really about our changing thinking, even back then when low fat was really in its prime. And over the years, I sort of began to sort of look at the literature more and more. And first, omega three fats were good, and then olive oil, and then. And then even just total fat didn't seem to be an issue. And now even saturated fat seems to be in question as whether it's a problem or not. So I began to sort of really take this seriously and uh, and really look at this aggressively. And I read thousands of papers and I, I reviewed over 500 of them in my new book, Eat Fat, Get Then, looking at the science behind this. Yeah, thank you. And uh, it's it sort of was, it was a difficult journey because there's so much controversy. And you've got people on both ends of the spectrum uh, uh, who seem like smart scientists saying opposite things. You know, one says low fat is the answer to everything, and the other's high fat is, you know, the answer to everything. We should be eating butter. And so I think there's a, there's a wide range of, of sort of opinions out there. I tried to sort of walk the middle ground and look at what the science shows, what's common sense, and, and I've come to kind of view that that we should be eating a diet that's relatively high in fat, probably 40 or 50 or, or more percent fat, good fats and very, very little refined carbs and starches because uh, they promote what I call diabetes, which is really what's driving most disease. And you say that, you know, I think one in two people is either has some version of diabetes or is there an immediate risk of developing it. Yeah, and and yeah. describe diabetes briefly for both those who haven't already wrapped their head around that concept because it's an unfamiliar term for some folks. So I, I didn't invent the term, but I, I popularize it. And it's it's basically this idea that there's a spectrum of imbalances in blood sugar and insulin from a little bit of belly fat all the way to more belly fat to prediabetes to type 2 diabetes. And anywhere along that spectrum, you're at risk for disease. And it shouldn't be considered you're fine until you get diabetes. I mean, the whole word prediabetes actually is sort of a give you a false sense of security. Well, I don't have diabetes yet. I just have prediabetes, so <laughs> it's okay. But it's actually not okay. In fact, you don't have to get diabetes to have cognitive changes, heart disease, strokes, cancer, all coming from this enormous amount of refined sugars and carbs and from low fat. So um, it's, it's a very scary phenomenon. And now we see not only is it affecting adults, but one in four adolescent boys have prediabetes or type 2 diabetes. It's amazing. When I, when I was in medical school, there wasn't one that I saw. Yeah. And now in Mexico, in America, it's one in 10 adults have type 2 diabetes. In Mexico, is one in 10 children. And I just saw a report of a three-and-a-half-year-old 
who had adult onset or type 2 diabetes from drinking soda. I mean, that's just mind boggling. Yeah. Well, you know, it's very interesting. What you describe in the book is this sort of inflammatory cascade that that starts going from the minute you get even a little bit overweight. And I know you and I, I, I have to tell this story. You were talking before about the, the, the controversies and trying to find some happy middle ground. And I was once privileged and kind of aghast to witness a conversation. <laughs> I could sit at the table with you and Dr. Ludwig and Dr. Ornish having a very spirited conversation, uh, a debate really about where the science is right now. Okay. And, you know, people can pick and choose studies to show the points of view that they want to demonstrate. They can give evidence for those things. But I do think that there's really something to be said for low fat diets having been given a pretty good run for their money. And I do remember in the late 90s and early 2000s, how many of my friends were determined to lose weight via a low fat diet. You talk in the book too about this semantics problem of how dietary yeah. fat, and I know Dr. Ludwig describes this too in his new book, which we have somewhere around here. We were honored Always to be hungry. Yeah, this is lovely. Another book. You guys um, have a lovely meeting of minds in many places, I noticed. But one of the things you both describe is the fact that that there's um, the clinical evidence dealing with patients on the ground, moving them from one diet to another and seeing in real life before your eyes, people's health and weight changing and their vitality yeah. and in many cases, their mental health and their mood, their hormonal yeah. balance. Uh, talk a little bit, if you would, about the state of the debate as it exists right now between you and your colleagues, many of whom I know you recently featured as in a, a fat summit that I was honored to be a part of as well. You got pretty much the whole spectrum, right? From Dr. Uh, Arnish and Neil Barnard all the way to you and Dr. Ludwig and others. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting because, um, you know, I'm curious and not religious. And I think many people in this field are religious about their point of view. It's not necessarily evidence-based. It's sort of an emotional attachment to a certain perspective. And you can go on to prove anything you want by what we call cherry-picking or select looking at if you really look at the mass of all literature and you look at the story it's telling it's adding up to a pretty conclusive perspective and this is actually was interesting this is the first year and the dietary guidelines just came out in january 2016 for 2015 it was based on a report by the dietary guidelines advisory committee which came out a year before and it was unfortunately a lot of the the good recommendations from the advisory group which is a group of scientists were actually not carried forward but one of the ones that was which I think didn't get headlines, but should have gotten headlines, which is for the first time since the guidelines were established in 1980, they eliminated any restriction on total fat. So there was no guideline at all to reduce total fat in any way. This is pretty stunning. For the last 35 years, we've been saying reduce your fat, reduce your fat, because there was really, after they looked at all the evidence, there was no evidence that dietary fat actually causes weight gain or even heart disease. A recent large review of the literature of randomized controlled trials of 53 studies, which Dr. Ludwig was part of that review with Dr. Walter Willett from Harvard, they found that there was uh, an improvement in weight loss on the high-fat diets, but not on the low-fat diets. So every time they compared high-fat to low-fat, the high-fat diet won out. And these are in well-done, long-term randomized controlled trials, which is different than just doing a two or three week study or a one week study where you can show all kinds of things. So for example, you know, Dean Ornish was a friend of mine, you know, he, we have different points of view. He quoted a study by Kevin Hall, which was a seven day study in a metabolic ward that looked at, but you know, there were so many variables that were kind of misrepresented in that study. And it's not free living humans. It does, they don't actually regulate their appetite. And there's all kinds of issues with adaptation to higher fat diets and shifting your metabolism from sugar burning to fat burning. None of that was taken into account. And when, when you look at these longer-term studies, it's really clear over and over again that they do better every, in every way. So I think, I think there are still the, the hangers-on. But, uh, you know, I mean, you, you talk to guys like Harvard, Harvard School of Public Health, Walter Willa. He's the head of the Harvard School of Public Health, published over 2,000 papers. And, you know, he, he was very vocal yesterday about uh, when I talked to him about the lack of evidence for low-fat diets for anything, for heart disease, for diabetes, for for cancer, uh, for weight loss, and that, you know, we really need to move towards, towards to away from that and away from the high refined carb diet. And, you know, Dr. Krauss uh, is another, you know, pioneering researcher who I got to interview. It was um, a guy who discovered the particle size of cholesterol. 
And uh, he said, you know, we were in the 80s, we were, he was on the American Heart Association uh, guidelines committees. And he, he actually uh, did a study back in the 80s, looking at low fat diets for helping with people with cholesterol issues. And they took people who were basically having normal cholesterol, and they put them on low fat diets, and their cholesterol got worse. Great. And they were shocked, they were completely shocked by, by this. And it was, it, it, they didn't know what to do with it. So you know, we see that this is really a big problem. So I think, I think, you know, there are still people hanging on that, that believe that we should all be eating low fat diets, but very few. Yeah. Well, we have the same problem in the media realm. And you and I talked a little bit about this when we spoke as part of your summit, that there are hangers on a lot of hangers on and a lot of legacy data that's left in the media business too. And where a lot of people get their best advice from are places like newspapers and magazines and television shows where terms like lean meats come out like just fused together, you know, only lean yeah. meats and uh, low fat dairy just kind of rolls off the tongue. Right. And all right. of these, and then, you know, people counsel um, folks to eat high fiber breakfast cereals that happen right. to have low fat or no fat. And you just kind of assume based on everything you've heard for the past 25 years that that's a good thing, even though yeah. many of those dietary recommendations raise blood sugar and cause all of the other inflammatory problems that you talk about. So right. when we are dealing now with a very confused public, some of whom are hearing just the part, which is not just the public, but confused doctors, confused nutritionists, you know, it's like, yes, confused insiders and confused experts um, who are responsible for giving this advice. You know, I, I look at Mayo Clinic literature that still has really outdated advice in it. I see uh, school nurses, I see government workers who um, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm on the um, I'm on the faculty and the staff of Cleveland Clinic, which I just joined. And we're trying to revise their dietary recommendations in the hospital for patients. And their heart-healthy diet is a high-carb diet. It's a low-fat, high-carb diet. And uh, I, mean, I met, even met with the vice chair of cardiology there. And he's like, you know, I was doing that. And I noticed it wasn't working for me. I was gaining weight and I was <laughs> cholesterol was getting worse. So I started a high-fat diet and cut out the sugar and carbs. And everything got better. I talked to the chairman of cardiology at Cleveland Clinic. And he says, Mark, you know, I was actually kind of sheepish because I'm like, I'm publishing this book. I want you to know, I don't want you to be blindsided. We should meet and talk about it and discuss the science. And he's like, Mark, you know, I, I think we got the whole story on fat wrong. And I even <laughs> think we got the whole story on saturated fat wrong. Wow. And uh, I was like, really? <laughs> <laughs> And uh, so it was, it's changing. But that's really encouraging to me to hear, Mark, because I think, you know, in some ways, it's like Mike, Michael Pollan says that there are two food systems. I've, I've kind of begun to think that there are two information systems with regard to this kind of, of, of information and advice around eating and nutrition. Insiders people who are reading this stuff and happen to have the time and energy and bandwidth to process all this information and listen to the big debates are experimenting in the, at these outer reaches, you know, of higher fat diets and having great results. But it isn't necessarily filtering down lowest common denominator to the pamphlets you pick up at your doctor's office or the magazine that you read while you're in the waiting room or the counsel that you're getting from, you know, even your health club or your, um, your health coach. And so I think it's really important for people, you know, one of the pieces of counsel I have is start reading books as opposed to just these quick little listicles yeah. and decide for yourself, you know, who you want to believe based on this stuff. And the other thing is, of course, testing it out on your own body. Now, the second part of your book is really dedicated to a program that gives yeah. people very pragmatic advice on how to test this out for themselves. And I think you make a, repeatedly the point that, that you can't just eat a bunch of fat and hope for the best, that fat has to be part of a whole food eating program, yeah. this rich in phytonutrients and fiber. Really, it's a it's a heavily plant-based diet and that you're eating a crap load of yeah. vegetables and you're eating a bunch of healthy fats and, pro yeah. and proteins in the process. Can you just give people kind of the nickel tour of the eating program so they can decide if this is something that they might sure. want to try? Sure. I, I joke and I, you know, I call it the pegan diet because... <laughs> Because I, I basically was on this panel with two friends of mine, Frank Lebman, you know, and Joel Conner, you know, who's basically one's a cardiologist who's a vegan, the other is a paleo kind of advocate. And I'm in the middle and I'm looking at them and I'm kind of laughing and I'm like, you know what, I, I must be a vegan because I'm sort of in the vegan. middle. <laughs> nice. And then I and then I begin to think about it. I'm thinking, well, what are what are the things that we all have in common? We should all we all agree that we should be eating whole unprocessed food. 
all should agree with being food that's very low glycemic index, low in refined sugar and refined carbs. We should all be, when possible, eating sustainably raised food, organic food, food without pesticides, hormones, antibiotics. We should all be eating food without additives and chemicals and artificial sweeteners and MSG. Like everybody agrees on that. We should all be eating a plethora of colorful fruits and vegetables. We should all be eating good fats. And I'd say most people agree with that, including avocados and almonds and nuts and seeds and olive oil, extra virgin olive oil. These are things that everybody agrees on. I think there's actually more that they agree on than they don't. And and that's essentially the, the, the framework. And the things that they disagree on are, and they don't, by the way, disagree on dairy. Uh, dairy, both camps think dairy is not a health food. It's really a, uh, a potential problem for a lot of people because it's linked to cancer, diabetes, weight gain, inflammatory diseases, prostate cancer, allergies, your little bowel, on and on and on. And I think it's, a, it's, it's not necessarily a health food. So I think both camps either agree that it should not be eaten or really in, in minimal amounts. And I, I agree with that. And then there, there really is only a few areas of controversy, which is animal protein, beans, and grains. Those are just really the only discrepancies. And it may seem like big ones, and they are kind of big ones, but I, I think, you know, the pegan view is that meat should be a condiment, right? It should be not the staple of your diet. You shouldn't be having huge, you know, T-bone steaks that are 18 ounces, but, you know, she's something in the palm of your hand, maybe two times a day, and that's a moderate amount of animal protein. And the thing that people don't realize is that if you eat a lot of protein, it can actually turn to sugar in your body. There's a, a mechanism called gluconeogenesis that converts protein to sugar when you eat excess protein. Uh, and then, uh, you know, uh, grains. I think gluten is a big issue for many people. Other grains, and quinoa and, uh, you know, wild rice, black rice, these are grains that actually can be tolerated by most people who don't have other issues, digestive issues, autoimmune issues. And then beans, the same thing. You know, there are, there are controversies about beans, whether they have lectins or uh, various kinds of compounds, phytates that inhibit mineral absorption, that cause inflammation. And for some people, they do. But again, they can be tolerated by many people. So, But I don't think those should be the staples of your diet. I think the staples should be mostly like non-starchy veggies and lots of good fats, avocados, nuts and seeds, almonds, coconut butter, olive oil, good quality animal fats that you can get, whether it's grass-fed butter or whether it's from the uh, animals on your organic farm in Wisconsin, you know, like there, there's a lot of, uh, of good fats that we can eat in our diet. So I think that's really the view. And it's, it's not prescriptive in terms of exact ratios or percentages. It's not prescriptive in terms of calories. If you just focus on what you eat, instead of how much you eat, then your body automatically takes care of the rest. If you focus on quality and not quantity and not worry about the quantity, the quantity takes care of itself. I mean, I sort of say, if you have you know, one big gulp, that's 46 teaspoons of sugar, 750 calories, and people do consume that in a single setting uh, or sitting. Whereas if you wanted 750 cups of broccoli, that's 21 cups of broccoli. You're not going to be able to eat that and if you could, you'd like you'd explode. You know? So you kind <laughs> of eat a lot of down. right. So I, I think uh, it's it's just really common sense, and and I think it's uh, it's a little bit contradictory to what people think in terms of fat. But if you just add fats to your diet as part of every meal, you'll be you'll be great. Yeah. Well, you know, I think one of the things that I've observed about your counsel in the time that I've known you and been following your work, which, uh, you know, actually we started the magazine in 2001. And I think, uh, when did Ultra Metabolism came out? That was the first- 2005. 2005. So from 2005 until now, basically, um, we've been in cahoots. And I think, you know, your counsel to me has always been focused on the more fundamental pieces and your emphasis has been on eat whole foods, eat this way, get these toxins out of your diet, experiment with what you need to do to make your body work for you. Cause you, you know, people are different. Some people can manage dairy better than others. I will never forget the day I was like, ah, ha, ha, I can eat dairy. I have no trouble. I had no digestive problems at all. And you looked at me and you're like, you're a little puffy under the eyes there. <laughs> I think you might have a dairy problem. And, you know, I went off of it and I have felt so much better ever since. Um, but I didn't realize that. And it really took me experimenting it with getting it out to find that. But yeah. I think that that counsel has become much more commonly embraced by other experts. I don't think you're a crazy person on the wall anymore. You know, you're not a wild-eyed lunatic. You're a clean I used to be, right? <laughs> 
(laughs) (laughs) I don't think you were ever a wild-eyed lunatic, but I think you were a progressive, forward-thinking advocate for what was really, at the time, a more experimental approach. And I think 10 years is a long time to be experimenting with real people in real clinical settings and also real, you know, clinical trials and things that have been run. Yeah, it's been been astounding. I mean, I have like, you know, 20 years of experience with this. And I used to recommend low-fat diets. So I've seen the changes. And I had a patient recently who was struggling with her weight. Her cholesterol was 300. Her triglycerides were 250. And she just, you know, was just not doing well. And I said, look, why don't we try something crazy? Because I think you are carbohydrate intolerant. Let's get you off of all carbohydrates except vegetables. And by the way, vegetables are all carbs. And let's eat like 70% fat like butter, coconut butter, olive oil, avocado, just like high fat. Let's see what happens. Well, for the first time in decades, she lost 20 pounds and her cholesterol dropped 100 points. Her triglycerides dropped almost 200 points and uh, very quickly. And I was just shocked to see how powerful this could be for the right person. That's not to say everybody responds the same way. And I think this is something people have to recognize. And I talk about in the book, it's based on this idea of of personalized medicine, that we're all genetically different and that uh, each of us responds differently. And in fact, there is even a genetic test that I'm offering as part of the book and program, which is called Nutrigenetics, which is how does your body respond to different foods? So some people are more carbohydrate intolerant. Some people need a little bit less fat. Some people have more trouble with food addiction or brain chemistry. And we can actually learn how to modify our diet and the inputs to fix that. Yeah. I do know that that's true, that there are some people, and it may be a momentary thing where they just don't digest fats very well because they don't have enough enzymes or HCL in their system, or they're not eating enough fiber. They end up with gallbladder trouble and digestive distress. <laughs> so it's not to say that everyone should just go out and you know eat a jar of coconut oil today. People have to experiment. And, and also to some extent, I suppose you'll find out by doing this kind of program if you have any negative results too. And what do you counsel for people who are doing this, you know, feeling healthy overall, but, you know, the switch in the diet isn't working very well for them digestively, for example. Should they seek a functional medicine practitioner, try to get some direct-to-consumer lab testing? So, you know, one of the things that I talk about, and and if you get the book, you get a whole bunch of bonuses. Uh, I encourage you to go to eatfatgetthin.com because, One of the things that I write about in the book is uh, what we call beyond food, other causes of damage, metabolism, and weight gain. So it may not be what you're eating. It may be that you have a thyroid problem or you have environmental toxins that are contaminating your metabolism, like heavy metals or pesticides. It may be because you've got food sensitivities. You're very inflamed from that. It may be because you have a leaky gut. It could be the bacteria in your gut. We now know the microbiome plays a huge role in our metabolism and your risk of diabetes and independent of calories. So uh, there are many things that are not actually what you're eating that's causing the problem. And functional medicine allows you to sort through that. So I go through this special ebook. It's called Beyond Food. um, And I go through the eight different reasons for weight loss resistance, why people have resistance to weight loss. And it's a real thing. And then you can begin to personalize your approach based on this. And then if you get stuck, I talk about how to find a functional medicine doctor. You can come to Cleveland Clinic, although we have about 1,500 people on the waiting list, <laughs> which is insane. I've heard that. I heard you're getting a little busy there. Yeah, we're hiring doctors like crazy. If you're a functional medicine doc listening to this and you want to come work for us at Cleveland Clinic, uh, start applying. We, um, we have, uh, we have uh, practice in Lenox, Ultra Wellness Center, and functionalmedicine.org. There's a whole a group of certified practitioners that you can find around the country. So there's really a, a pathway for people to figure out what's what's wrong with them. Yeah. Well, I know that you're a busy man, so I don't want to keep you much longer, but I want you to give folks the website again so people can find out about that. Obviously, the book is available just about everywhere, at least by the time that uh, people see this video, it will be. And I encourage people to check it out. We'll be doing more with you in the future. We're very proud to feature you in the January issue, actually. You're one of the, the resources that we say we love you can see yourself right there yeah oh look at that thank you yeah well we do and so for folks who want to check out these extra um content elements and learn more about the book it's eat fat get thin that's right and also there's a we have a library online of the fat summit which has already happened but is an amazing series of 33 different interviews i've done with experts including you about fat and fat 
from scientists, fat from practitioners, fat from the perspective of the media, and uh, trying to tell the story from a very balanced perspective of what we know and what we don't know. So people and, actually uh, want to hear you and Dean Ornish talk about this live yeah, and in person. Yeah, that's right. Dean Ornish <laughs> and I go at it. I go at it with Neil Barnard. I, I have, uh, you know, Dave Asprey on, the Bulletproof Coffee guy, David Ludwig, you know, who's new program is 50% fat. I mean, here's a Harvard professor who's not just studied the research, he's actually done the research. I mean, I, I don't do the research, although we're starting to now at Cleveland Clinic, doing the research. And in his research, he's really convinced himself that high fat is the answer and written a book about it, which is pretty stunning from a, you know, MD, PhD, Harvard, Stanford, uh, conservative guy, conservative scientist who, when you start looking at biology, you know, you have to change your mind. Yeah. Well, I hope people will be open to experimenting and changing their minds if that's appropriate for them. And in the meantime, I want to thank you again so much, Mark, for all of the wisdom that you've imparted over the years in Experience Life magazine and all of the help you've given to millions of people changing things around. I think you're, you're making an immense impact. And I know your work at Cleveland Clinic will uh, only continue continue to grow the footprint of that work. So thank you and come back and join us again sometime to talk more, okay? Thank you, Pilar. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure.